Let's do a recap on oral radiology. So we're going to zoom into radiation and we're going to start with the basics. So when we look at what radiation is, in simple words, it is an energy. It's a form of energy that is transmitted in waves. Okay, so there's waves happening. We can't see those waves and that those waves are creating radiation. There is radiation all around us. Think about the sun. The sun has radiation. That's why we wear sunscreen to prevent us from getting cancer from those radiation. Um, when we're listening to music, when we turn on the station, there are radio waves happening. When we take x-rays, there is radiation happening as well. So things to keep in mind is when you're looking at the wavelength, um, there could be long wavelength. So this is an example of a long wavelength. And the reason why it's long is because if you measure from one side of the wavelength to the other side, it's long, right? So the distance is long. So wavelength is the distance of the wave. And then um, if you look at this one, you can see it's a lot more shorter because if I measure from this end to this end, it's short. So this is an example of short wavelength. Now when you have a long wavelength, so these are examples of long wavelengths, it's low frequency. And when you see low frequency, what that means is there's less energy. So see how all the L's come uh, together? Long wavelength, low frequency, less energy. So there's less energy here. But when we look at x-ray machines, what do we see? We see short frequency because the distance from one wavelength to the other, it, it's short, right? So we see short wavelength, which means high frequency. Sorry, I meant short wavelength. We see short wavelength, which means high frequency. High frequency means there's like so many waves. Like if there's so many waves all you know, clustered together, that's high frequency. And so when we have high frequency, there's like a lot more energy needed to create these radiation waves. Okay, so again, X-ray, what is it? It's just a form of energy that comes in these streams of waves. Um, it travels really fast, like a speed of light, and um, it can cause damage, right? It can create something called ionization, which I'll go over what that means soon. And the way we measure the um, radiation is through frequency, which is if you see lots of waves, it's like high frequency. We measure it through wavelength. So if you see a big gap between the waves, then it's um, low frequency, long wavelength, less energy. Um, and we also look at the term velocity. Velocity is speed. How fast is it coming? Um, that's another way to measure radiation. So when we're looking at the physics, this is an atom and um, an atom has, oops, sorry. So this is an atom and an atom is basically just um, the smallest thing that exists and it's like a building block. Like you need a small particle and then um, you combine so many particles and it becomes something. So our human body is made up of so many gazillion atoms. So atom is the, is the smallest thing that's out there. Um, and what's interesting about the atom is that it is neutral. So you can see here the positive and minus cancelled out, the positive and minus uh, charge cancelled out. So it's neutral. There's no charge on this atom. But in an ion, there is a charge. So this is positively charged because we see more positive compared to negative. So this is a, a charge. And when we have radiation, there is ionization happening where there is a charge. And to measure um, radiation again, we look at wavelengths, which we talked about before. Wavelength is like the distance from one wave to the other right from the wave of the crest from one wave to the next wave velocity is how fast these waves are coming frequency is how many crests do we see so this is an example of low frequency high frequency would be like this because we can see so many more crests so that's frequency photon photon and quantum this is like a bundle of energy so when i am you know pushing the x-ray button we're getting radiation happening it's it's the photon that's creating, it's the bundle of energy or photon or energy that's helping me create the radiation. So here's an example of an electromagnetic energy spectrum and we can see here that it, there's a spectrum. Sometimes you can get really high frequency, sometimes you can get low frequency. So there is a spectrum and then there's some in between. So if we look at radiography, which is right here, it is the, you know high frequency, you need a lot more energy. 
When we're looking at the x-ray machine, there is the control panel, which is typically where the on and off switch might be. This is also where they would have settings to regulate um, the exposure factor. So for example, they would have a setting called for MA, which is called milliamperage, and they would also have a setting for KBP. Uh, which stands for kilovoltage peak. And so MA, you can adjust this. And what MA does is it, is it, if you have increased MA, so if you up the number of MA, you're gonna get a darker image, okay? So it's, it's to do with density. And so the higher the MA, the more dark. The lower the MA, the less dark. And we'll go over this in another slide. KPP looks at contrast. And what that means is that if you increase the KVP, you're going to get lots and lots of shades of gray in your images, in your radio graph. But if you decrease KVP, then you're just going to see black and white. Like you probably won't see many shades of gray, so you'll just see black and white. So KVP looks at contrast. If you increase the KVP, you're going to see lots and lots of shades of um, gray. And if you decrease the KVP, you're going to see more black and white, just simply black and white, not that many shades of gray. And we'll look at that later on too. Now, in an x ray um, machine, actually, let's go back over here. This over here is the extension arm. Okay, so this is the extension arm that can extend. And this is the tube head. And the tube head is where, was where all the magic happens. What I want to point out over here is this circle thing that we're looking at is your PID, position, position indicating device. And uh, this is great because it's, this is exactly where you know to aim, right? Which um, tooth you want to aim at, at is where you position the PID. It helps the PID. If you have a long PID, there's like 16 inch PID and there's also like 8 inch PID, for example. So the longer the PID, the more um, better, the better because it decreases the radiation. So we don't get that much radiation to the patient. And there's also less um, image magnification as well. So it doesn't, the, when you take, when the x rays come out, it's not ma as magnified. So let's see what happens in the tube head. In the tube head, what happens is when you push the x-ray button, what's happening is you're getting a bundle of heat um, right here. So for the cathode, this is the cathode, this is the anode. The cathode is where the negative part is, anode is where the positive part is. To remember this, think of C minus and then A plus. You want your grade to go from C minus to A plus, right? We all want that. If we have a C minus right now, we want our grade to, to become an A plus. So what's happening over here is you start with the C minus and what happens is this is a filament and this filament is creating so much energy, so much um, heat, sorry, so much heat and it's um, electrons that just come out. So you can see electrons have come out and the electrons need to go to the anode. How does the electron go there? Well, the KVP, the voltage will take it there. So depending on your KVP, if you have a high KVP, the voltage will just, you know, smack it onto the anode and the anode will catch it and, you know, slow down the radiation and take the radiation out this way. It comes out into the PID and it goes to the tooth and it takes a picture or takes the x-ray of that tooth. So the radiation, the way it happens is it goes from the cathode, goes to the anode. Remember, positive attracts. I mean, uh... Negative always attracts, opposites attract, that's what I want to say. So negative will always be attracted to positive. So opposites attract, that's why they're going to the positive side. The KVP is forcing them to go and touch the uh, target. It's called the tungsten target and the anode. And the anode releases the energy or releases the heat and the radiation, rather. And um, the radiation costs allows for the x-ray of this tooth. So here we have the molybdenum cup, which is right here. This is like a focusing cup. It allows all the electrons to stay within that area. So when you get so much heat here, electrons come out, get shooted into the tungsten target, which is where the anode is, and then the anode releases these um, radiation and heat. What's important is only 1% of that radiation is all that is needed to create that image. The other 99% is just useless. It's just... Um, you know, radiation that we don't really need, it's not useful, but the 1% is all you need to get that image. And so the cathode or the cathode releases that 1% of radiation that comes out over here. 
So here's a question for you. Um, which exposure factor has a direct effect on image contrast? Contrast. Remember, we looked at this before. When we're looking at contrast, it is KVP. And again, I just highlighted this so that you can remember that contrast and KVP, they both start with K, the K sound. So that's how you can remember that KVP and contrast go hand in hand. MA or milliamperage, that is for density. It's, um, you know, if you have, want a dark image, you need to increase the MA. If you want a light image, then you want to decrease the um, MA. A good trick actually to remember the MA is think about like, you know, you're baking a cake. So if you're baking a, um, a cake, for example, this is my horrible attempt of uh, drawing a cake, but let's say this is a cake right here. Um, if you increase the oven temperature, so if you increase the oven temperature, the cake will get burnt, right? It will get dark. If you increase the temperature, the cake will get dark. If you decrease the temperature, the cake will be light. So same thing with MA. Okay, so if you decrease the MA, you're going to get a light image. If you increase the MA, you're going to get a darker image. Now with radiation, we have primary, radi primary radiation and secondary radiation. The radiation that we need to get our image is the useful one, is the primary one. So that's the useful radiation, the useful beam that we want. But secondary radiation are the ones that we don't need. Those are radiation that are harmful to us, that don't matter. And so that a type of secondary radiation is actually scatter radiation. It's a type, it's a form of secondary radiation where instead of the x-ray going to where, or the radiation going to where we want it to go, it's going elsewhere. And this is why we wear like a lead apron so that it uh, protects the rest of our body. So when we're looking at scatter radiation, there are different types of scatter radiation. There's the Compton scatter and the coherent scatter. And then there's also the photoelectric effect, which is um, the radiation that happens. I'm going to go over all of these. Compton scatter is when you have this photon, this bundle of energy, this radiation going, and it finds a electron on the outer shell and it kicks it out. And when it kicks it out, this is ionization. So when the electron comes out of the shell, of this is the atom. If the electron comes out of the atom, we get ionization. And so what's happening now is the photon, the bundle of energy, the X-ray came, looked at, you know, knocked this electron out, and then the rest of the X-ray, the rest of the photon went elsewhere. That's a scatter. It went to an area we don't want it to go. So that's why it's known as the Compton scatter. Ionization happened because this electron was kicked out. This is very common. 60% of the time, this is what happens. You get a lot of scatter radiation. You get a lot of Compton scatter radiation. So Compton sounds like common. So this is the most common type of radiation we see. The coherent scatter, okay, is you... You can push the x-ray button, there's photon, there's that energy, the x-ray comes, hits the atom, and nothing happens. And, and then it just, and then like no electron comes out, then the photon, the rest of the photon just goes and gets scattered somewhere else, not in an area you're interested in. So no ionization happened here. No electron got out. So this is coherent scatter happens 8% of the time where it's you know, not harmful because no ionization happened. So there's no biologic harm here. Um, but there is scatter. So the image, didn't, the X-ray radiation didn't go to where we want it to go, but um, no ionization happened. Therefore, no harm happened. Photoelectric effect. This is what happens 30% of the time. And here what's happening is you push the X-ray button, the photons are coming, it's going to an inner shell, it finds an electron in the inner shell and it kicks it out. And when it kicks it out, we get ionization. Notice the difference between these two is that there's no scatter. There's no other photon that comes out and um, goes elsewhere. There's no other radiation that goes elsewhere. So Compton scatter is when you get photon in, photon out, and electron out. Photoelectric effect is when you get a photon in, electron out. But no photon out, right? Nothing else has come out. Coherent scatter is when you get photon in, photon out, but no electrons. So no ionization over here. 
So here's a question. Ionization occurs in which two interactions of X-ray photons and matter? I'll let you have a look. You can pause it. The answer is B, photoelectric effect and Compton scatter. This is where ionization happens. Let's look again. Photoelectric effect. We can see the electron has been bounced out, kicked out. Ionization happens. Compton scatter. The electron has been kicked out. Ionization happens. Here, no electron has been kicked out. Therefore, no ionization has happened. So therefore, the answer for here is indeed B. Let's um, recap some things we have learned earlier. Which term describes the speed, the speed of wave? It is velocity. Velocity looks at how fast the waves are coming. Um, so the speed of wave is velocity. Frequency is how many wavelengths, the number of wavelengths. So this is could be high frequency, and this could be low frequency. Lots of energy here, not so much energy over here. Wavelength is the distance from one end of the wave to the other end of the wave, that's wavelength. And quantum is also known as photon, which is like that bundle of energy that happens. When you hit the X-ray button, the energy, the photon, the quantum comes out um, and gets passed through. The useful beam is also referred to as which type of radiation? Useful beam. It is primary radiation. Primary radiation is when the beam is produced at the anode, um, it's also referred to as the useful beam. Secondary and scatter radiation, those are um, radiation that uh, the X is when the X-ray beam has been altered, has gone a different route. Here is um, KVP. So we're going to look at KVP right now. And what, you, what I want you guys to know is that with KVP, when you have a high KVP, so 90, for example, is considered high, you have a low contrast. And I'll explain this in a bit. But when you have a low KVP, so 40 is considered low, you have a high contrast. What does that mean? What does contrast mean? So contrast means what is the difference from this color to the next color and here there is not much of a difference there's a low difference so hence low contrast but high contrast is when you see a significant difference from the black to the gray you can see that significant difference that's a high contrast so sometimes when you have high kvp or not sometimes all the time whenever you have high kvp you have low contrast because um, the difference from this band to the next band is very low it's very little so you have low contrast but when you have a huge difference between the two colors that is considered a high contrast and so typically what happens is when you see many many shades of gray this is increased kvp this is a high kvp that's good to check for bone abnormalities so if you want to check for bone conditions bone abnormalities this a low um, contrast or high kvp would be good but when you just want to check for cavities so caries then a low KVP, which should do it, because now you want to see the, really the difference between um, where the cavity is, so the black, compared to um, the other shades, right? So high contrast or low KVP is good for caries. High KVP, low contrast is good to see, um, of course, to check for bone abnormalities. All right. This is MA, so when we look at increasing the MA, the milliamperage, you're going to get a darker image. Think about like, you know, cooking in the oven. When you're cooking a cake in the oven, when you want a dark cake, you're going to put it in more. You're going to increase the temperature. When you want a lighter cake, you're going to decrease the temperature and you're going to get a lighter image. Now what we're going to do is look at some images and figure out what the error is. So when we look at this image, you can tell that there is, it, it looks gray and there's not much of a contrast, right? As, so it's like a fogged film. And this can happen if, um, you know, the lightning, the lighting was off in the dark room. It could happen because of scatter radiation. So these are excess radiation. Um, it could happen. There's so many reasons it could happen because of heat, the humidity was off, um, the chemicals were contaminated, or it could have been an old image. So this is an example of a fogged film that is gray. It doesn't have that much contrast. Many reasons why this could happen. 
Let's look at a dark image. So this is a dark radio graph. Why do you think this could have happened? This is an overdeveloped film. And it, an overdeveloped film happens to um, show up as dark. And this could be because of the developer solution. If the temperature is too high, this can happen. Um, if you developed it for too long, so you, the time for developing was too, was, for, you know, was too long, this can happen. So again, we don't really um, see this as much because we don't use the developer solution or the fixer solution. Um, we don't use a dark room as much because we're now digital, using more digital um, types of radiographs, but this could happen. Look at this light radiograph. This is an underdeveloped film. And again, temperature of the, the solution was off. It was too cold. So when we look at this one, if the temperature is too high, this dark image can happen. If the temperature is too low, if it's cool, um, you can get a light image. Okay, so low temperature, light image, LL, right? Low temperature, light image, dark temperature, um, sorry, <laughs> high temperature, dark image. Now, what can cause a clear um, radiograph? Well, that can happen because it wasn't exposed to radiation. You didn't push the x-ray button. Um, or, you know, this film didn't actually get exposed in the mouth. And that's probably the main reason why you get a clear radiograph. Um, sometimes you can get a completely black radiograph. And that's because you, when you opened up the film, it got exposed to light. And then you process it. So when you expose it to light, it will become black. Here we see spots. And these are fixer spots. Okay, so when you're going to the dark room to develop the films and you got fixers splashing, the solution splashed on the film before it got processed, it creates these dots. Okay, so radiograph with dots is because of, it's known as fixer spots. They appear light or white as we see here. Let's look at angulation. So angulation of the x-ray beam, vertical angulation is when it goes up and down. So vertical angulation, you can get positive, which is on top where you're aiming the PID up. Negative is when you're aiming the PID like this. So at the from downwards, um, so the, the PID is pointing upwards. Here, the PID is pointing downwards. So this is positive. This is negative. Look at the numbers. And this right here, straight on, is zero angulation. This is horizontal. So when you aim the PID's dead on like this onto the occlusal plane, which is like where the occlusal teeth are, like right there, that is horizontal angulation. But when you aim it up or down, that is considered vertical angulation. And negative vertical angulation is when you aim the PID like this. And positive angulation, vertical angulation, when you aim the PID from above. Now, in terms of technique, we have the paralleling technique and we also have the bisecting technique. So let's look at the difference between the two. Paralleling is when you take this uh, PID and you literally aim it right at the um, the tooth. And if you look at the film, when you put the film and you look at the tooth, they are parallel to each other. So you're hitting the beam perpendicular, so right up right at the tooth but if you look at the long axis or the line of the tooth to the film line it is parallel parallel means when two lines are running uh, beside each other okay so this is the uh, this is a really good one because when you do parallel and there's a very little image distortion you won't get um for shortening or elongation or any distortion of that sort because paralleling is a good way to get an image Bisecting is more challenging. You may remember the snap array. This is a snap array here. And what you're doing over here with bisecting is you're here, you're applying the rule of isometry. And this is a little more difficult because here you have to imagine um, the bisecting angle. So what, what are we looking at here? This is the, the long axis of the tooth. This is the line that you can just draw on the tooth. And here is the film right here and you have to imagine there is a line a bisector an imaginary line right in the middle in between the receptor and the tooth and that is where you're going to shoot it at you're going to shoot it right at the imaginary line and this is called the rule of isometry and actually when you look at this if you look at if you wish to draw um if you wish to look at the imaginary bisecting line there is a 90 degree angle which is right here 
The reason why it's called isometry is because of that 90 degree angle. You have equal triangles on one side and also on the other side. So 90 degree angle on both ends. Two equal angles. This one unfortunately produces more distortion than paralleling technique because um, it is very hard, right? It's very hard to visualize that bisecting angle. And I'm sure um, some of you guys did struggle with this in uh, radiology. So here again is another um, image. You can see here the film um, and the long axis of the teeth are, if you look at this line here, the red line, it is parallel, hence paralleling technique. But bisecting technique, when you look at the long axis of the tooth and you look at the sensor or the film, it's not parallel. It's, it's, you just have to imagine that there's a bisecting angle right here, a bisecting line, a line right in between those, and that is where you're aiming at, right at this line. So it's a little bit more challenging to do. Let's look at this image over here. This is an example of a bite wing. So another, actually I should probably start with this one. Another um, type of intraoral imaging is, so we looked at paralleling, we looked at bisecting, then there's also bite wing. There's horizontal bite wing and vertical bite wing where you hold the film vertically, where you place the film vertically. So why do you need to do bite wings? Why would a dentist prescribe bite wings? Well, maybe there's interproximal cavities. Maybe the restorations aren't, you know, proper, so it's defective. Or maybe they're suspecting periodontal disease. And if they're suspecting periodontal disease or periodontitis, to be more specific, then they might want to do a vertical bite wing so we can see the bone level a lot better. Okay, so uh, vertical bite wings are great for perio. So if I were to look at this question here, what is one reason that the dentist may have prescribed vertical bite wing images for this patient? Look at the options and tell me what you think. I know the letters aren't there, but it is this one. It is A, because of the increased pocket depth since the last visit. So um, we're suspecting periodontal disease, so we want to see their bone levels, which is why we did the vertical bite wings. Uh, when you have a gag reflex, we do not, you know, there's, that's not an indication for vertical bite wings. Um, when they have occlusal decay, we're not really going to see the occlusal decay here. It's not an indication for vertical bite wings. Um, and a broken amalgam on the maxillary molar, you could see that with a, you know, a, a horizontal bite wing or even a PA. You don't need to do vertical bite wing for that because vertical bite wings looks at bone. 63, what is the reason for the lightness of this image? Why was it light? Okay, so I know we didn't necessarily talk um, much about this, but if you can recall from radiology class, uh, one of the things that happens is if your time is too low, Okay, so if the time is too low, um, the exposure time, you can get light image. And think of um, this just like MA, we're looking at MA and we were like, if you're baking a cake and you put like a low temperature, you're going to get a light image. Same thing with time. If you decrease the time and if you don't, you know, if you use less time to cook, if you only put the cake in for 10 minutes versus 20 minutes, you're going to get a lighter cake, right? So same thing with time, same thing with MA. The exposure time setting was too low. That is why there is lightness of this image. Developer solution was too warm. If that was the case, it would be dark. The image would be dark. Fixer solution was too cool. If that was the case, the image would be dark. KVP setting was too high. If that was the case, if KVP is high, you're going to have a darker image. You're going to have many a high con or many shades of gray low contrast sorry low contrast many shades of gray because of the lightness of this image this film can be described as low contrast is the answer when you see many many shades of gray it's low contrast when you just see black and white um that is considered high contrast so low contrast is the answer here this arrow is pointing to a radiopaque structure. So radiopaque is something white. Radiolucent is something like, you know, black. What is this radiopaque structure that we are, that this arrow is pointing to? It is the internal oblique ridge. So this is a bone that just extends downward from the ramus of the mandible. So there's a, in the mandible, there's a ramus of the mandible, and that ridge is the internal oblique. 
mental ridge. This is a ridge that you would see near the premolar of the mandibular. This is in the molar, so it can't be the mental ridge. Um, zygomatic process, that would be at the top, is in the maxillary arc. Median suture, that is something you would see between the maxillary central incisors. So the best answer here is this internal oblique ridge. What is the restorative material used in the occlusal surface? Um, I know that the thing has been cut off, but if you were to look at the posterior teeth, what do you think the material is in the posterior teeth? Amalgam, gold, PFM, or composite? Yeah, it is composite. So composite, this is what it looks like. You can see it's less radio-opaque. Amalgam would be a lot more radio-opaque. Um, gold will also be a lot more radio-opaque, which we don't see. PFMs, they usually have a, um, would also be radio-opaque, and there would also be a porcelain component um, as well, which um, we don't see. So this is definitely a composite.